Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody into the fifth annual Longwood Media Showcase. I never thought I would say this, but it is great to be in Weigel Hall. It's so good, exciting to be back here in person this event. Of course, last year we did it as a fully virtual event here. Uh, this year is like many things will probably be happening in the future. We have a Zoom audience joining us. Say hello, Zoom uh, pre presenters. They're nine, they're at least 10 seconds behind us. Oh, there we go. And, and we are also, as I think we'll be doing going forward this year, we are live streaming this to YouTube. So hello, YouTube world. Thank you all for joining us here. Uh, this is kind of one of the great things that's come out of this. We could do things both for an in-person audience here and of course stream them, living stream them as I put in a tweet earlier today, out to a YouTube audience. So before we get started here, let's talk about how this is gonna work tonight. We had 59 different entries into from 48 different people into five categories here. So we had a panel of seven judges who watched all of these different entries here, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna screen the top three in each category tonight, uh, and then we do have some certificates, the commies here, if you will, and some cash, Amazon cash prizes for those that are in the top three of each category. So when we screen the top three here, they will be in no particular order. Then after we've watched all three of those, we will go ahead and announce the winners and we'll ask the person who plays first in each category to come up, talk us a little bit about their piece, what they did, so on and so forth. So before we get to that, we do have some thank yous to give out. So first thing we need to do is thank our judges who gave up their time to watch all of your pieces. So the first of, oh, the first judge we wanna go ahead and thank is about to leave with my child. So let's thank Dr. Leah schilling over here for her time. No idea how she got that job. Screams nepotism if you ask me. Uh, then we also want to thank our next judge, Mr. Kenneth Edward Halliday IV, who was our special guest judge this year here, so we can give him a round of applause. <laughs> we also want to thank our judge, the judge, the chair of our department here, Professor Jeff Halliday, for his time. Uh, next, I mean, this is ER, but you know, we got to throw a bone once in a while. So Dr. Alec Osterman, who also joined us as judge. <laughs> Uh, we also want to thank Dr. Dr. Ray right here in right the house, house. Our, one of our judges right in the front. And, and frankly, we couldn't do this thing. We couldn't do any of this. The, the programs were like what we're doing today, also the content we're going to today, watch today without our last judge. The only person I know who is a master of awesome as well as a fake doctor of awesome, Dr. Awesome, Mr. Clint right here. Let's give him a big round of applause. So uh, in addition to our judges, uh, we want to thank some sponsors here tonight who made possible the Amazon cash prizes many of you will be receiving later. So, uh, most of you don't know these first two names, but one person does. Uh, we want to thank Dr. Nancy Marcos and Dr. Vonnie Colvin, generous donors of the event this year. We also want to thank Dr. Ann Crandallis, who also, Jamila, the only one that probably knows, who also was a big donor this year, so let's thank her. Uh, we do want to thank all the Love Your Longwood Day donors here. There's many of you out there in YouTube land, so thank you very much for supporting this event here in our fifth annual edition. So round of applause to those. And finally, of course, under the former leadership of Dr. Johnson and the current leadership of Professor Halley, we want to thank the Comm Department, because they have sponsored this event from year one. So let's give them, the Comm Department, a round of applause. All right. So that gives our welcome, that gives our thanks here, and that uh, gets us up to our first category tonight. Zoom can't hear me. They should be watching on YouTube. Are they not watching on YouTube? Dylan, are you watching on YouTube? Can you hear me on YouTube? Yes. Okay. Thank you, though, Tyler. I appreciate the... This has been the year, right? We just jump in and say, ah, oh, yeah, you forgot to unmute yourself. Oh, your Zoom's been signed out. All sorts of fun things like that. So the first category we're going to move on to here is to promotional. So we had a bunch of different entries in the promotional category. The promotional category here is pieces that are under four minutes that promote an organization, an individual, or an idea here. So we will watch the top three in the promotional category in no particular order, and then we'll go and announce our third place, second place, and first place winner, and we'll hear a little bit from the first place winner. So first up, again, in no particular order here in the promotional category is Miked Up with Hunter Gillum and Longwood Baseball, produced by Dylan McKercher. Money bag, yo. <laughs> oh, wow, Jack. 
One more. One second. <laughs> Money bag, yo. <laughs> oh, wow, Jack. <laughs> One more. Me, me, me! <laughs> Too short for that one, Jackie. Nope. Rosie. Bro, what are you doing? Yeah, I know. He, he breathing hard now and think he can box Floyd Mayweather. Oh God, oh God. Woo, woo. <laughs> here, mic'd up with Hunter Gilliam and Longwood Baseball. Of course, I turn out the lights, I can't read my program. That's a fun thing. Next up, again, in no particular order, is the Alpha Gamma Delta recruitment video 2021 by Jamila Cromarty. Let's take a look. Listen, baby, ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low, ain't no river wide enough, baby. Before her girl, so she the fine. She 
you gotta say please Say please And I know they really wish we would fall Till we fall on the big bad wolf There's a full moon That was the Alpha Gamma Delta recruitment video 2021 produced by Jamila Camardi. So our third video in the top three of the promotional, again, in no particular order, is Longwood Social Work produced by Dylan McCurcher. I feel like Longwood's social work program prepares me by giving me content that I can apply um, really well. So like a lesson that goes beyond the textbook, being able to apply it in a real world practice when you graduate. In some ways, the social work program is its own community. Um, students are very engaged with the professors here at Longwood University. We know our students by name. They often come and visit us for our hours to request student feedback and support. Our students also have the two social work student organizations where they can build connections among each other. And as they matriculate to the, through the program, they often have um, classes together and that also allows them to build community. The best thing about the social work program is definitely the faculty. I have a super close relationship with all four of my professors. Definitely helps that we have small class sizes. Like, I don't think I've had more than 15 people in a class. Like it's nothing to walk into the whole building, which is like where all of our classes are held and just like you know almost everybody like you could walk down the hall and like wave to almost every single person that you see or say hi to almost every person every professor and I think that's really nice. I try and diversify the teaching so that I'm meeting the needs of everybody. We don't all learn the same way and so I think it's important that we have um, ways to connect the curriculum to things that they already know. So bringing in current people to um, talk about what's going on in the field so that they just have that um, real life aspect. Our team of instructors with a lot of support that we get from administration and um, others at Longwood have resulted in a continued commitment to keep our academic programming on a curve of being ever more rigorous, structured, we want students to feel very, very supported so that they can take risks outside of their comfort zone. So uh, I think our students feel busy in a very, very productive way so that by the time a student enters the field experience, their junior year, they have had very, very rigorous, structured, and productive classroom instruction. So as I said, my junior year, I was placed with probation and parole and I loved it and it was so awesome. And that's a population I had no idea I was interested in um, working with. But then this year, I'm hoping to be placed in family preservation services. And so families and groups is something I realized I'm interested in through the program. We do a lot of extracurricular types of activities. Um, some of our classes require volunteer hours outside of the classroom and so when we do that um, it's it's connecting the students and helping them to know that service is a, a big priority in the field of social work and then helping them just be able to make those connections with external agencies and programs that might be out there. Social work program definitely models all the values from the code of ethics it's like the one thing that's like pounded into our heads um, importance of human relationships and dignity of worth of the person are the two things that I think the program does for us students because they never see us as another student it's always a personal relationship and what can our professors do for us this program prepare, prepares our students to be citizen leaders um, because really that's what social workers are right we are we are trained and we know, have the expertise and knowledge to be aware of ourselves and as others, to identify areas of advocacy and how to support others. A lot of the values central to social work also are embodied as citizen leaders. I would say that Longwood Social Work is a place that you really feel valued and like you can put your best foot forward and they really want you to learn and grow and feel appreciated and your opinion and what you say and what you believe really matters to the professors and to your peers.
social work produced by Dylan McKercher. So, without further ado, let me grab the very academic envelope here, and we will look at our top three. Our third place winner in the promotional category is, flipped upside down, Jamila Kamardi, Alpha Gamma Delta Recruitment 2021 video. Congratulations. Please do come up after to get your Tommy. No, after. After. Second place goes to Dylan McKercher here, uh, Longwood Social Work. So Dylan, let's give Dylan a round of applause here. And that means first place also goes to Dylan McKercher, mic'd up with Hunter Gillen and Longwood Baseball. So Dylan, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. We good? So Dylan, tell me a little bit about this piece, producing some work. I know you did a lot of work like this behind the scenes this year with Longwood Athletics. Tell us a little bit about it, please. Yeah, so this is actually the very first video I did this semester uh, with Longwood Athletics. Um, it's a part of our mic up uh, sights and sounds videos with the department, and uh, we went on with baseball. It's one of the first practices of the season, and uh, we mic'd up Hunter. We just uh, basically just uh, tracked around with him for about two to three hours. Uh, he's a really funny guy. He's a lot of great stuff. And then uh, the biggest uh, struggle of this video was just combining all the great material down into a minute and a half. And uh, my favorite part about the video was uh, the rapid fire hits with the, uh, the baseball from the beginning and the end of the video. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dylan. We love the So folks, we had a problem this year. We have never had a situation where we had so many high quality documentaries produced in our digital storytelling class. Uh, this was a hell of a year produced documentaries as all of our subjects who were working on them and many of us who have done them before can attest to and can imagine here. Uh, so what we did, we're gonna do something a little bit different this year. Uh, we have an honorable mention of uh, six documentaries this year that fall into the honorable mention category. And so while we don't have time to show all of the documentaries, we are gonna take a look at the trailers. All these documentaries can be found on YouTube here, so we're gonna watch a couple of trailers here between each segment, give you an idea of all the hard work my students have put in this year, uh, and their products of their outcome, which can be found on YouTube. So, our first trailer we're gonna go ahead and watch here in the honorable mention documentary category here. So we wanna give a round of applause for K-pop, Through Your Eyes, produced by Audrey Killian Peel here. So let's give Audrey a round of applause. I will turn off the lights and let's take a look at her trailer. Okay, so I guess we should just start off with how you like that, I guess. I guess we should. How, how you like that? I love how they drop down. Yes! Yeah. K-pop, it's loud, it's exciting, unique, addicting, explosive. It just doesn't stop. It's like it's new content comes out every day. There's always something different going on. I love the music videos. The music videos are so amazing. It's not just K-pop as a genre. It's it's pop. It's R&B. The thing I keep trying to ask myself over the years is why? You know, why did I get so obsessed? Why is this such a huge part of my life? And why has it been such a huge part of my life for the past three, four years. And I think, honestly, it has to do with the fandom. At the end of the day, it comes down to the people that I've met from K-pop. Uh, amazing people from around the world, kids, adults, teenagers, and everything in between, all obsessing over the same things and forming these incredible bonds because of this music, because of this place that we all feel connected to. YouTube, you can find that. The next documentary we have in the honorable mention category here, in no particular order, I can't read my paper, so it's in here. 
way down in the Valley of Mud, produced by Jessica Boggs here. So let's go ahead and take a look here. The Italian military was sent up there, the Italian army, and they were digging out the corpses of people. And they said, well, if you don't go to flight school, you're going to Vietnam. I said, well, send me. And so they did. In the tent next to me, uh, he had just gotten off the plane from Saigon, just gotten in the country, was unpacking his stuff, and that loud mortar round was in the tent. Uh, it, it got him. Uh, it put trap metal through his lungs. Once you get into combat, it's 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 odd. Uh, you know, you're not afraid. Uh, you just concentrate on what you're doing, and you don't you don't think about yesterday or tomorrow. You're just you're just there. I guess I've I've grown up in in one way or another all my life. You just have to put it out of your mind, and that's, you just block it out. So again, that is the honorable mention documentary category. We'll see a couple more of those. Please do check those out on YouTube here. The next category we're gonna move into is the news category here. So this will be pieces under three minutes that could be in the inverted pyramid style or the feature style story. So again, we will watch the top three in this category in no particular order, and then we'll announce the winners here again at the end. So our first piece in the news category is Longwood Election 2020, produced by Dylan McCurcher. <laughs> Welcome back to On the Record. I'm Dylan McCurcher. On Tuesday, November 3rd, the 59th U.S. election will commence, where Democrat candidate Joe Biden squares up against current 45th President Republican Donald Trump. Ahead of this year's election, I had the opportunity to sit down with a member of each political party organization here on campus and ask about their thoughts on the 2020 election. Secretary of the College of Democrats, Junior Mitch Costello, is voting for Joe Biden because she does not agree with how the current president has been handling the country and has been upsetting to her. Costello said that voting blue in 2020 will be the first step in improving the country. She states that voting the 2020 election is important due to the previous year's lower turnout. That's not a good representation of the country because if you don't get everyone's voice, then you don't have everyone's ultimate opinion. And so if you want like a true opinion of the country, you need everyone, everyone's votes to be there so you can have a true reflection of how people feel. On the other hand, Vice President of the College of Republicans, Senior Royce Coleman, believes that voting is important in all elections as it is a civic duty. He states that the best way to have your voice heard is by going to the polls and voting. Coleman will be voting for Donald Trump on Tuesday. Um, I believe he is the best candidate. Uh, Joe Biden's been in office for 47 years and I've seen more results from Donald Trump in 40 months. Um, I do like his economic plans. I like his prison reform that he's passed and police reform that he's passed. Joe Biden couldn't do it in eight years and Trump got it done in less than four. Leading up to this year's very polarizing election, here at Rotunda Studios, we decided to host the Longwood 2020 election. On Wednesday, October 28th, a poll was posted to our social medias, as well as being distributed by both the College of Democrats and Republicans to eliminate bias and give a fair playing field for all. The poll consisted of three mandatory questions and one optional. These included, are you a student or faculty member at Longwood University? What gender do you identify as? If you are a student, what year are you? Who are you voting for in the 2020 election? The poll was left open from noon on the 28th and closed at midnight on November 1st, collecting a total of 135 responses, resulting in the Longwood community voting 54.8% in favor of Democratic candidate Joe Biden. 
39.8% in support of Republican candidate Donald Trump, 5.2% to Libertarian candidate Joe Jorgensen, and one vote for 0.7% with a response of not voting. Taking a closer look at the breakdown per candidate, starting with Biden, out of the 95 voters who were female, 61% voted in favor of Biden, compared to the male population, where only 40% of voters went blue. Then, of the 126 total students who partook in the study, 53% voted blue. Then on the other side with Trump, only 35% of the female population voted for Trump, with exactly 50% of the male voters in favor. Then 41% of the student population voted red in our mock election. Once again, this report and poll was done without bias. We involved both political parties' organizations here on campus to help distribute the poll and have their voice heard. However, we do agree with what each representative said. The 2020 election is super important. In fact, every election is. If you'd like to have your voice heard and did not do a mail-in absentee ballot, head out to your local registered polling location on Tuesday. Make sure to follow us on socials at Longwood Rotunda on Twitter and Facebook, as the Rotunda and Rotunda Studios will have more coverage of the 2020 election and its impact on the Longwood community in the upcoming weeks. For Rotunda Studios, I'm Dylan McCurcher. All right, so that was again election, Longwood Election 2020 produced by Dylan McCurcher. The next one we're going to watch in no particular order is the, the Clark, uh, oh, again, I cannot read the Clark Intercultural Center studio news piece produced by Aubrey Gray Watson. So let's take a look. If we think about legacy, family, and home, uh, nothing speaks to those three quite as well as, you know, the Clark family. Legacy, family, home, and belonging. These are the values attached to the Clark House. The Clark House has been a part of Longwood and the Farmville community for many years. It was home to Longwood alum and professor Ter Dr. Teresa Clark and her family, home to many of Longwood's offices, and now it is once again going to serve as a home this time to Longwood students after reopening as the Clark Intercultural Center. The Clark House reopened as the Clark Intercultural Center on September 21st, 2020, marking a new chapter in its long history of serving as a home. I recently had opportunities to speak with individuals with close connections to the house, each one providing insight into its transition over the years and its legacy of belonging, homeliness, and family. Jonathan Page, the director of Multicultural Affairs, aided in the creation of the new Clark Intercultural Center, and he underscored the values of the Clark family and the house during our interview. These values motivated the center's development and are what he believes makes it a place on campus for marginalized students and for all students at Longwood. You know, I want the center to be a space for everyone and not just viewed as, you know, a space for, you know, a certain identity or a certain group of people. Um, it is the campus center. It is the campus intercultural center. So when we moved into the Clark House, um, I'm not going to lie, instantly, it just had this whole sense of home. Miming Page's sentiments of home and belonging, Dr. Pam Tracy, director of the Center for Faculty Enrichment, commented on the time her office was located in the Clark House and on the importance of the Clark family's relation to the center. Given the Clark's history in this county, given their current passion and dedication to Farmville in particular, it makes tons of sense that an intercultural center would go there. But this project would not have been possible without Dr. Teresa Clark. Dr. Clark has promoted ideals of family, home, and belonging for as long as she's lived in Farmville and been a part of Longwood. Her legacy pushing the university and the community to embrace diversity and inclusion, and she hopes to see the center do the same. I would like there to be peace emanating from this house, that the individuals who will occupy at different times or work in the house will um, promote unity, peace, collaboration. 
I'm Aubrey Gray Watson reporting from Longwood University. Back to you in the studio. Next up is On the Record, episode 21, Sun Chase Cinema reopens, produced by Dylan McCurcher. Welcome back to On the Record, I'm Dylan McCurcher. On August 21st, Sunshine Cinema 8 reopened for movie-going audiences after being shut down on March 17th due to the coronavirus pandemic. After having doors closed for over five months, I had the opportunity to speak to General Manager of Sunshine Cinema 8, Jacob Herzig, about their reopening during a pandemic. For our particular location, uh, business has been rather slow starting out, but the only thing I have to compare that to is how things were before the pandemic. I did not expect us to get, you know, a huge crowd our opening day or even our first week. At the time when we closed, I, I wasn't too concerned. I thought this would, just like everybody thought, all business sectors, that it was going to be short term. As the months dragged on, I realized, you know, this could be an issue. It's, it's actually serious. And we're just, you know, it's, I kind of have a little doubt that um, people want to come out not just to movie theaters, but just go about, you know, go about their regular business like they were before. The Longwood community is one of Sunchase's biggest markets. In hopes of offering a safe and entertaining venue to the community, Sunchase has invested in a hospital-grade disinfectant spray, as well as a mission on how to keep the parameters safe and clean. We are required to sanitize every shared surface after use, whether it's a customer or employee, even if it hasn't been used, um, every two hours. And we're using a hospital grade uh, disinfectant called Botanicline. It's, it's proven to neutralize the SARS-CoV-2 virus. There are sanitizing stations located throughout the theater, one in front of every auditorium, there's two in the lobby. So pretty much no matter where you're at, unless you're inside of an auditorium, there are uh, sanitizing stations to use. Herzig continues going over additional safety precautions, including some for the staff, which Herzig stated that the cinema rehired over 50% of workers from before the shutdown. They're still actually going through training. Um, you know, the ones that have been here, of course, have seen most of everything. It's mandatory hand washing every 20 minutes almost. We do have a uh, daily screening questionnaire uh, dealing with COVID-19, and it actually needs to be signed and dated by each employee when they come into work before they actually start working. Uh, they basically confirm that they are not currently suffering from any symptoms dealing with COVID-19. With social distancing implied in the individual auditoriums, a max of 30% capacity can occur due to the customers being spread out by at least three seats in between all guests and different parties. There can be a maximum of five people sitting in the same group. Herzig additionally said that Sunchase employees will be having check-ins in each auditorium every 15 minutes during showtimes to make sure social distancing rules are being enforced. Uh, we, we, we don't allow anyone to enter the building without a mask. We do offer masks to anyone that don't own one. People will purchase beverages, uh, food. Of course they can remove their mask while they're consuming beverages and food. It's encouraged to put the mask back on once they're finished. Herzig states that it's pretty normal to have to wear a mask nowadays. and It's basically a part of the uniform. He does not expect many issues at his theater and welcomes all that feel comfortable to venture out to come to Sunshade Cinema. If you do plan to venture out to catch Christopher Nolan's brand new blockbuster, Tenet, or any of the classics that Sunshade Cinema 8 are currently showcasing, make sure to wear your mask, space out, and enjoy the show. Showtimes can be found on their website at www.sunchaycinema8.com. For Rotunda Studios, I'm Dylan McCurcher, and I'm signing off. Right, so the official envelope, the winners are in third place, Clark Intercultural Center, produced by Aubrey Gary Watson. Let's give Aubrey Gray a round of applause. I'm sensing a pattern. Second place, Longwood 2020 election here, produced by Dylan McCurcher. Let's give Dylan a round of applause. And that means also in first place, uh, episode 21 of On the Record, Sudden Chase Cinema Reopens, produced by Dylan McCurcher. <laughs> Dylan, come on in. So obviously, Dylan, this is the end. What are some of the times you're going to reflect on and some of the things you're going to reflect on 
from your time in the uh, digital media concentration here at Longwood? Yeah, so um, the biggest thing I think I will, oh, <laughs> there goes my computer, but the biggest thing I think I'll reflect on is just how um, helpful and how grateful I am for everyone involved because, I mean, in that video, um, I know you, uh, Dr. Stouffer, were able to lend a hand with uh, some drone shots as well as a big shout out to Tyler Hall for being uh, my, uh, my B-roll boy in that video, getting some popcorn and uh, washing his hands. And uh, um, I'm just very thankful for all the help that I've been able to receive these last four years in the department, whether it's from teachers or other students. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what um, other students are able to put out these next four years. Awesome, thank you, Dylan. We're gonna miss you. So congratulations again, Dylan here. This means the news category, Upper Gray is also grad graduating. The news category is wide open next year, so time for some other people to win. So what we're going to do here, we're going to move into the next two honorable mention documentaries. Again, we'll check out the trailers here. Uh, so the first one we want to check out is VA Spies at the Movie, produced by Corey Hugenberg and Anthony Jackson. Your mission, if you choose to accept, is to gather as much information as you can about agents in Virginia. I gained a lot over here, more because I put in the effort to learn it now. If you want to move out in those, in those cities, I would do it uh, sooner rather than later. You gotta be specific about what make it means. We have this thing of being a small state, I guess, so people don't think that we do, but I, I think they do. Mission complete, great job. I'm proud of the work you have done, Anthony. When Troy Loveday laces his boots up, that name is no more. Instead, he becomes one of the toughest SOBs in professional wrestling scene. Fans love him or hate him, but that doesn't stop him from doing everything it takes to beat his opponent, even if it means playing a little dirty. I've been in the ring or backstage with just about everybody. Since starting his very own professional wrestling promotion, the BWF, he's been able to mentor the future wave of professional wrestling molding them into future champions. He's not a big hot flyer. Yeah, he's been here for 25 years, so he's, he's willing to share all of that knowledge with, I mean, really anyone that's around. But, uh, you know, he can get in there and he can work his ass off. It was uh, one of the first and only times I bled in a wrestling match. Grab a seat and strap in, because this is the story of... That was the story of Bruiser Graham, produced by Tyler Hall and Dalton Floyd. Let's give them another round of applause. All right, so now we're gonna move to our next category here, the LGBTQ plus category. So let's bring our own Dr. Aaron Wagner to introduce this one. I feel like I need to put the theme music on right now. All right, so uh, similar to the other categories, the LGBTQ plus film category, it's, um, it is open, we have an LGBTQ plus movie in the uh, class in our civil pay program here, but we also open this to anybody uh, who wants to add or uh, contribute to the LGBTQ plus media uh, scape. So this is a really great year. It was fun doing this class because it was all filmed made during the pandemic. Uh, and so teaching a film class during a pandemic for students who are not digital media students, by the way, it was very, very fun. <laughs> very fun, but I have to admit that these students did a rock star job and I'm so proud of them. Um, with that said, we are gonna watch the top two in the category. There were several, because we had 10 movies and then also the additional submissions, we did have several uh, submissions in this category. And so we are gonna watch the top two uh, in no particular order. 
So the first one we will watch is Light at the End of the Tunnel, Running Into Love, which is Mandy Chamberlain, Gretchen Wiggins, uh, Mel Flippin, Nora Walker, and Tasha Hyder. myotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Unfortunately, there is no cure. What we can do is provide medicine. And... <sighs> you know I love you, Lily. Don't be so sad. I know I've raised a strong woman. You'll be okay. I love you too, Mommy. Hey, Samantha, I was thinking, you know how my mom is, was an avid runner? Yeah, what about it? Well, I've been thinking, I want to do something about it. I've been looking into ALS and it's hereditary. And I don't know if I'll get it, but while I still have this body I know I can use, I was thinking I want to look into raising funds for ALS by running across the country. So, you know, I would tell people about it, try to spread the word of what I want to do, hopefully get some attention on TV, you know, uh, raise awareness for donations and everything, and like maybe get attention of like a newscaster or a journalist or someone else interested in spreading the word of what I want to do, start a GoFundMe page, and, um, you know, everything, if, I make anything would go to researching this. Don't you think that's a bit too much? Your mom was a marathon runner. No offense, but as your friend of 15 years, you can barely run a mile without getting out of breath. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to put you down. It's just that this is a lot to take on. You know, and I'm I'm worried that you're going to throw yourself into doing something crazy and then you're just going to get yourself more down than you already are. This is a lot. It's only been a month. I mean, running across the country is a lot for anyone. For a bit of wholesome content today, I bring you the story of a young woman trying to run across the continental United States in an effort to raise money to donate to research on ALS after losing her mother to the illness only months ago. We've met several times between her training to talk about what inspired her to do this. According to Ms. Lily Calmer, she decided running fit her situation best as her late mother was a marathon runner and they had a shared favorite movie, Forrest Gump. Her goal is to raise $1 million. We wish you luck on your adventure. So, run Lily run. If you would like to help contribute to Lily's cause, Go on our website, and on the homepage, there will be a link to her GoFundMe. Her journey starts officially on April 20th, 2021. How about we Netflix and chill at my place? Get the fuck off me! Damn bitch! I didn't want your ugly ass anyway. Samantha was right. I'm in over my head. I should have just listened to her. Why did I think I could do this? I have asthma. I've never been super athletic. I miss my friends. I miss my family. I miss my mom. Maybe I should just stop. I've raised a lot already, but 
I'm not even halfway to my goal. Or am I being selfish? Fuck, I don't know. But what if people don't believe I really meant to finish this? Mom, I wish you were here. What should I do? I miss you. Why did you have to leave? I have to keep going. I have to. Ugh! I just don't know what the hell I'm doing here. Mom, what do I do? I have no one. Hi! Are you okay? Here, let me help you up. Whoa. You're Lily Connors, right? I have been following your story and I gotta say, you're incredible and such an inspiration. I've been following your route on an online map and I can't believe I actually get to meet you. I am so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. Are you okay? Yeah, I, I'm fine. Um, and yeah, I'm Lily. Um, I'm sorry you're meeting me like this, but I'm glad I could inspire someone out here. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Oh, no, oh, you too. Um, I'm Marissa, by the way, and no sorry necessary. Actually, if you wouldn't mind, could, could I go running with you just for a few days? I mean, if, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, I guess that'd be fine if you want. Uh, I usually have a bag of clothes and whatever I get sent from hotel to hotel while I'm running. Um, do you have anything you can bring? I'm almost at my next stop. Yes, oh my gosh, um, if I could just run home. If you won't mind waiting a minute, I could grab a backpack and pack a few things and then we could run up to the hotel together. Oh my, just five minutes, I swear. GoFundMe page in a bit, but we made it. I've reached my goal. I how we raised one million dollars. We did? Wait, we did? We did it! Oh, I can't believe it! I know. Now I can finally stop running. You want to stop running? Of course. I was never really into running. I just did this to raise money after my mom died. I mean, I had a goal. I reached it. Now I can finally go back home. It'll be so good to be home again. All I have left to do now is to buy a plane ticket. What about your followers? What about the people you've inspired? Well, and there's still so many sights to see. I just... I'll miss... I'll miss running with you. I'm gonna go to the front desk and get some coffee. Maybe she's right. I mean, she even said she was inspired by me. I can tell I'm already letting her down. She can't be the only one I'd be letting down either. I know I've never been a runner, but it actually hasn't been that bad. Well, at least not after she started running with me. Marissa, you were right. I was thinking while you were getting coffee for a while this morning, um... I'm sorry. I was being selfish and I needed a moment to cool off. No, no, no. You were right. I'm gonna keep running. And I was thinking, you know, I know you originally said you were only gonna be with me for a few days, but I'm really glad you stuck with me these last few months. And I've been blind and selfish and I've been wanting to say I like, I like you. you. You do? You do? Yeah, I, I do. I really do. You know, if I'm being honest, I was so alone before you ran up and helped me back on my feet. And getting to know you these last few months has been amazing. You're amazing. And i sure I miss everyone back at home, but I think I'd miss you too much if I didn't give this a chance. Give us a chance. That is, if you want to. Can you just shut up and kiss me?
<laughs> I need you to meet someone. Hi, I'm Marissa. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Chase. I am 21 years old, 5 foot 11. I'm a Pisces, and here's my Tinder. For my first image, I just wanted something that looked good. I think I look really good in this, and I just wanted to show just my face and nothing else. For this next photo, I just really wanted something where I can just have an ugly face, but still be seen as funny. For this photo, it's a little vogue -y. I had a lot of problems with my body this past year, and it was nice to see that I was finally growing some muscles and I was becoming more comfortable with myself. This is, this is my boy. This was when he decorated my graduation cap with a little disposable camera and a little gay flag. On TikTok right now, there's this trend where you show what you look like when you turn around, and I think this is the nicer version of what I look like when I turn around. So, fun fact about this photo. I got married that day. This photo is definitely one of the snazziest. I looked hella good in this, and it was my first modeling gig, and I just really wanted to show off what I looked like. I think I had one of like, the biggest grins I've ever had in this picture. I really just liked how happy I looked. I really wanted to show that in my profile, even though I smile in every photo. I think this one is like my most happy one. Even though I have a lot of smiling photos, I don't have any where I'm laughing. And this is what I look like about 10% of my day. I will just sit in my apartment and I will make myself laugh. I tell the best jokes to myself, but I'm really hoping I can make someone else laugh too. So my interests are photography, working out, art, Netflix, and secondhand apparel. So I am a photographer for Longwood University, and I work as a freelancer also taking family photos and graduation photos. One of my biggest passions is photography. I am currently working on a piece about masculinity in our culture, and it's spanning so many different projects of mine that I really think it's going to be my lifelong project. So here is my bio. Do you like guys with one crooked tooth? Do you like someone who is so funny it's dumb? Do you want a photographer boyfriend? then look no further than this six-foot college half-Italian who should probably stop drinking loads of caffeine. I love caffeine. I am about to have my second cup of energy drinks today. And before every workout, I drink pre-workout. And I am so caffeinated by the end of the day that I need to take melatonin to go to sleep. Passionate about my art, and soon you too, when I'm nervous, my face will twitch and it looks like I'm winking at you. Guaranteed to get the family convo going. There has been a lot of times where my twitching has resulted in people think I'm hitting on them. And it's been way awkward. But sometimes people find it endearing. Sometimes people think that I'm actually winking at them and it works out for the best. I guarantee that at one time or another in my life, my twitching is going to affect me a lot. Guaranteed to be the only boy you date that won't bring you home to his parents. Hashtag orphan life. So my parents died when I was a kid and I've been living with my aunt and uncle and my uncle actually just passed away. So it is now just me and my sister and my aunt. I really just want to find someone who has a big family. I think big families are taken for granted and right now I just don't have a big family because so many of them have passed away. My Spotify anthem is Motion Sickness by Phoebe Bridgers. She is the love of my life and if I were to pick any concert it would probably be Phoebe Bridgers and Mitski together. I think when COVID is over I'm going to try to go to a concert. Follow me at SamChase16 on Instagram. My name is Sam Chase, and that is my Tinder bio.
Chris, what part of Jonah's story are you? All right, so. Dylan MacArthur. <laughs> He's not in it. Oh, I put Dylan MacArthur in there. No, it's not. <laughs> see like the Tinder profile or like how much he's catfishing you on his profile? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so you made, so this wasn't a film that wasn't made in any class, right? No. <laughs> you also like created an entire green screen in your apartment, I heard? I pinned, my, my landlord's not going to be happy, <laughs> I hope he's not watching this, I pinned a ton of uh, nails in my wall with a gr big green uh, Backdrop, yeah, I need to fix those <laughs> before I move out. <laughs> yeah. So what po possessed you to, to make the film? Well, uh, Tinder was giving out $10,000. Um, Fear Street Me Meg Thee Stallion, if any of y'all have seen the um, ad on TikTok. And I'm like, oh, uh, I'm a con major. Stouffer taught me pretty well, I think. I think we put something together. I lost. <laughs> um, <coughs> well, now you won. Yeah, now I won something. <laughs> Uh, I did not win, yeah, so I'm $10,000 still poor. <laughs> but you got an award for it. I got an award for it. I'm very happy. All right, well, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Well done, Sam, and well done to everybody in that category right there. All right, so we're going to move forward here. The next time we have two more honorable mention uh, trailers from our documentary category here. So first up. Let's watch Grab Her, produced by Aubrey Gray Watson. Then we'll roll into the next one, and I'll tell you who it's produced by. Stay tuned. My name is Jessica Boggs. Yes, I am Michaela Jennings. My name is Eleanor Stuck. Uh, my name is Sarah Kuznuski. Nicole Dawkins. You dropped to your knees. Yes. That must was be right. a pretty picture you dropped to your knees. I feel angry and I feel objectified gets out and she starts asking me all sorts of ridiculous questions and you know you could see there was blood coming out of her eyes uh blood coming out of her wherever it's just terrible like it doesn't make me feel good and the things that he's saying is not okay she's gotten a little bit large i would say this i don't think you should dress like you weigh 120 pounds she shouldn't dress like she weighs 120 pounds i think is the direct quote um, as somebody who has struggled with being underweight her entire life, you know, I'm finally, I finally, you know, have realized that I am at a healthy weight. But then for him, hearing that specific quote of, she shouldn't dress like she weighs 120 pounds, I don't weigh 120 pounds. I've said that if Ivanka weren't my daughter, perhaps I'd be dating her. You know? <laughs> and there's the one where he sexualizes his own daughter. Um, it's always creepy. No one enjoys that. Do you believe in punishment for abortion? Yes or no, as a principle? Uh, the answer is that there has to be some form of punishment. For the woman? Yeah. Disturbed? I know you'd seen all those before. Nothing here is new, just... Like, that was the president? Nobody has more respect for women than I do. Nobody.
they said I miss you. I ripped it up and flushed with the tissue. Try to forget you. I ain't got nothing against you. We human, we all got issues. But I'm tired of being tired of being tired. That's part of me that die. I see it, then I don't act like I'm blind. I'm confident it won't be one of mine. No emotions come with lies. So I tell the truth all the time. Ain't got no sympathy for no fool. I admit that I'm rich and I'm lit. Jumping up on stages, I get 200 occasions. Bro, I ain't really the game. Oh, we make the shut they trap down. They see how I made it. I'm work That was We Will Overcome the Black Mental Health Story produced by Aaron Barksdale. Let's give Aaron a round of another Aaron. <laughs> All right, time for our second to last category of the evening, the creative category. So the creative category is kind of that hodgepodge category. We'll see some music videos. We'll see some creative short stories. We'll see some other programming in this. So we get a nice variety of different type of programming when it comes to the creative category. The one common denominator is, of course, they're all fiction and they're all under seven minutes. So again, we will watch these in no particular order. Uh, the first one we're gonna watch here, and I'm not gonna come up in between here, so we'll just kind of roll through these and tell you all the names and producers after. But the first one we're gonna watch is Freedom, producers Michaela Jennings and Charles Lee Tolson. say that the cage bird sings of freedom and once free they would tell you how they sing their song if this is true then listen now to my tune and i will tell you of my journey how i escaped saw hatred and the goodness still in the fight listen now once and for all and i will sing you the song of freedom And after my escape, my journey seemed to last forever. I ran, I grew tired, but nevertheless, I continued. I 
also was met with hatred and I understood the fear that my people had. But I eventually found a way to get free and when I became free, I understood the danger still. Ten Hail Marys, I meditate for practice. Channel 9 News tell me I'm moving backwards. Eight blacks left, deaf is around the corner. Seven misleading statements by my persona. Six headlights waving in my direction. Come on. Five oh asking me what's in my possession. Yeah, I keep running, jumping the aqueduct, fire hydrants and hazard. The smoke alarms on the back of us. But mama don't cry for me, rap for me, try for me, live for me, breathe for me, sing for me. Honestly, got in me. I can be more than I gotta be. Stole from me, lied to me. Nation hypocrisy, code on me, driving me wicked. My spirit inspired me like, yeah. Open correctional gates in high desert. Yeah. Open our mind as we cast away oppression. Yeah. Open the streets and watch our beliefs And when they call my name inside the concrete I pray it forever Freedom, freedom, I can't move Freedom, cut me loose yeah. Freedom, freedom, where are you? Cause I need freedom too I break chains up on myself Won't let my freedom ride in hell hey. I'ma keep on running cause a winner don't quit on themselves Will you be the revolution? I wonder if there's another me somewhere in the world. Who looks the same and talks the same and even has my curls. Someone with my eyes my ears who even has my laugh <laughs> who can do what I can do and can't do what I can't I've looked and looked everywhere to find another me I went down to the park and looked behind the trees. I looked around, up and down. At every single face. I couldn't find another me in any single place. 
There is only one me in the world. I'm special. Oh, it's true. But not just me, don't you see? There's only one of you. Hi, uh, so um, yeah, I'm Jim Faison. I'm what you would basically call uh, the average college golfer. Uh, I like to keep a strict routine through my daily things. Usually I wake up early around 5.30, well, well before the sun rises, and uh, start cooking a big healthy breakfast for myself. Just to get uh, the morning started right, maybe a cup of coffee if I'm feeling a little down. Um, you know, the greatest thing about golf is that you get to spend quality time with your best friends and you just love every minute of it out there. Fuck, I hate playing with Jim. Dude sucks ass, he's always talking shit. He thinks he's so fucking good. I don't get it. It's exactly what I'm fucking talking about. I mean, there's just nothing better than a nice summer day out on the Mother links with the boys. God, I fucking hate this game. Dalton, stop talking while I'm swinging. God. I don't need it. I'll just buy more balls. Yeah, you know, like when I started playing, I wasn't really all that good, but then, like, I don't know, it took me about 10 days or less just to catch on, and then now my friends basically call me the young Tiger Woods. Nobody ever calls him that. Nobody will ever call him that. He sucks at golf. I hate playing with him. He was never, ever meant to play golf. Hey, man, don't you ready to play? I was born to play this game. It tastes better if it was a keg. Start off my day at the course. Light up a nice sig, get energy flowing. I mean, it's probably gonna hit on the green first drive, I'll say that much. Get a little warm up in, you know. Ah, a little tight. Did some Zumba yesterday. Four. Lost the ball, but I mean, it probably just sitting in the hole, so I'll just go walk up and check it. Yeah, right where I left there, only one again. Dude, shut the fuck up. Hey, Don, you mind take some notes after that poor performance? Hey, don't touch my ball. I don't want you messing with it. I mean, it's easy. I'm probably just gonna hit a little chip shot, sink it right in, gonna curl back around, hitting Dalton in the throat, and then he's gonna cough it up and spit it in the hole. Didn't know we're playing with randoms today. I thought my dad bought the whole fucking course. The best thing I love about golf is just an honorable game, man to man. Like, no no disrespect. That sucked! Did your little sister teach you how to swing? Are you sure you don't want to go tee up from the woman's spot? I left my putter at home, so I gotta use his. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's. I, mean, just, I just love it. Respect all around. Another hole, another sig. Some of the greats play with this. When I played with Tiger, he did it with me too. Loving the way I'm playing right now. It's a great day. I'm, Great hits. Oh, that's it. All day, all day. You hit anything like that before? Probably not. Fuck, oh, wait, wait, I gotta get it again. Good drives. God! And they were singing on Jackson, mother! I don't even wanna play. You know what I didn't do good? I didn't have one of these in my mouth. Forgot the one rule of golf. And the putts are just on today. I mean, I haven't missed one. I hate this game. Get in the cart, we're leaving. It's done, shoot's done, we're leaving. I'm just um, so happy to be a part of everything going on today and just all the recording and just getting to experience 
the life of one of the best college golfers around. So thank you. All right, so again, the creative category, I love it, right? We get such a variety here. So without any further ado, let's see the winners. In third place in the creative category, the first piece we watched, Freedom, Michaela Jennings and Charles E. Tolson. Well done, Charles E. Oh, that's okay. And we're not gonna believe this, but there's a tie for first place. So, tied for first place, the second piece we saw among seven judges, mind you. Seven judges watched these and we had a tie for first place. The Story, produced by Monet Allen, which was the second piece we watched. Come on up, Monet. Let's give Monet a round of applause here. Just careful there, please don't trip. Well done, here's your Tommy. So tell us a little bit about that. So here, come up here, Monet, if you would, please. So we had a uh, project in my intro to editing class here, and Monet, normally you work in groups. And they came up to me day one and said, can I work by myself? I got an idea. So tell us about that idea that we saw come to life. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't even know what I was thinking. I was really scared because I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, it's, it was so much work. And I remember I submitted um, the thing that we had to say, like, what we're going to do. And I, I, like, put my name for each job. You were like, that's a lot of <laughs> jobs for one person. I was like, I can do it. So, yeah, um, I don't know. I love, like, as you can see, like, I put subtitles. I'm a, I always say this. I'm a sucker for subtitles, and I don't think anybody in my, I don't know anybody who in my group would want to do that. So I was like, you know what? I want to do something on my own. Um, it's just, it, yeah, like, it's a creative story that we had to make for the storybook, but it's kind of, like, a part of, like, who I am. I always put, like, heart in my video, so I wanted to do something that I was going to be proud of and that I could show off and I can do, so... That's what I did. <laughs> I did. Thank you. I did. Thank you, Monet. Very Thank well you. done here. So that also means the last piece you watched, The Average College Golfer, produced by Liam Wells, tied for us. Liam, come on up here. Please, yeah, don't trip. Liam, well done. There is your Tommy here. Thank you, thank so, you. Liam, tell us, is Jim that much of an asshole? Uh, no, he was faking most of it <laughs> and stuff like that. But I'm actually really surprised about this. I didn't even think Dr. Stouffer was going to give me the A-OK -okay to make this. I had no idea it was going to go this far. But I had a lot of fun making it. A lot of it was scripted. A lot of it was improv, too. I had to sort through just so many different cuts of B-roll. And I mean, the first draft, I think, was like 10 minutes. And just knocking it down took forever. But uh, it was a lot of fun to make. had a lot of fun doing it. Okay. Thank you, Liam. We'll Thank see you, you next year here. All right. Hi, Charles. Well done. <laughs> I forgot my phone. Thank you. All right. So, moving on to our last and final category of the evening. By the way, the categories we've currently seen, the first place prize is valued at $50. The second place prize is valued at $25, and the third place prize is valued at $10. So check your emails tomorrow. You will see links to redeem those. Uh, the documentary category. That, that is my, huh? Thank you. Well, uh, the documentary category, which is my uh, pride and joy here, uh, it's one of the classes I, I brought to Longwood, uh, typically only shows three documentaries. Well, we, we saw six trailers, and it turns out we have another tie. So I guess Clint should inform me we're gonna actually have to watch four documentaries and we as a top four here. Uh, I will say this year, as with doing many things in life, uh, everything has been more challenging. And so it makes me extremely proud to watch all these pieces. Of course, a lot of them I had nothing to do with. The students all did the work. Uh, but the documentary category itself makes me extremely proud here uh, because I know what these students have been through. They have spent hours upon hours upon hours. Uh, we started this assignment on January 8th, 9th, 10th, something like that. And here we are May 3rd. 
and they have finally, as of last night at 11.59 p.m., finished these here. So these are going to be seven minute or more pieces that are either subjective or objective in nature. It's your choice. And as Clint just informed me, we got four to watch. So uh, we'll take these again in no particular order. The first one we're going to watch here is From the Streets to Success, the story of Sean Weiss, produced by Megan Shirtle. Growing up in Petersburg, what I experienced was a lot of drug and gang activity in the neighborhood, the particular neighborhood that I was in. Watching the fellas in the neighborhood sell drugs, uh, you know, ride up and down with their rims on their vehicle and, and do these things is all I really saw. Um, these are the guys I looked up to, guys I wanted to be like. My mother couldn't afford to live in um, anything much nice, so a lot of homes we moved into, my um, stepfather, um, at the time, he would ask the landlord or um, whoever was renting the place where we could do some of the work to get in there. Growing up in homes that where we had to blanket ourselves with three, four quilts just to stay warm because of the heating conditions, you know, heating the whole house from a oven. You know, sometimes just a kerosene heater with boiling water on top. So living in those conditions um, over time, as I grew, it always made me feel that I deserved better and I wanted better and I was going to shoot for better. I spent a lot of my summertime riding around, snatching clothes off people's clothesline that looked at good enough for me to wear to school, you know, and to fake as if they were new, bought clothes. People would ask me, well, where you get this from? And I couldn't even explain. I would make up names of malls that I heard from the next person, but actually, I was just snatching people's clothes off their line. Before I bought my first car at 16, me and a couple of friends put together to do that with drug money. Before that, I stole a few vehicles and would ride around as if they were mine. Um, we, as a group, used to, you know, go into the mall, Walmart freely, and get whatever we wanted and walk right out. And we had plans for if someone got behind us, we would, you know, had a path that we had made. Um, it was kind of like a routine thing. We did gang bangs where, you know, catch someone in the neighborhood that didn't deserve to be right there, who we felt didn't deserve to be there, we would, um, you know, chomp them, you know, just to get our name out there. I ran the streets with absolutely no fear. I was actually chasing death in a sense where, you know, nothing, I mean, absolutely nothing. I was gun toting at the age of 14, 15. You know, I, I, I moved out of my parents' house at 16. I really thought that I was not gonna make it to C21. So, you know, growing up, in the neighborhood where guys were dying left and right anyway, it left me with no fear. When I first met him, he was hanging on the corners. He really didn't have any goats. He was going to the youth bill, but it was, I think he was just doing that just to do it. I don't think he was like fully involved in it yet. Me wanting to get my life on track had came right after finding the youth bill program. I got into um, some trouble with selling drugs and, you know, I had um, a gun charge, I think, at a young age. And the youth bill program, they saved me, they allowed me to come and do service while being incarcerated. And with the mix of the two, I got my GED, I graduated from the program soon after just learning how to do 
simple plumbing from there. It, you know, that kept me, that kept me out of trouble, you know. It kept me with money in my pocket. At the same time, I have a trade that no one can take away from me. With this youth bear program, they gave the youth a chance to get their GED and learn a trade at the same time. And with doing that, we also went different places and they showed me that the world was bigger than just Little Petersburg. And I really wanted more from hearing what we could do with our lives and what was out there for us. I got a job with a contractor and shortly after that, I realized that I could do this on my own by hearing different people tell me. And there's one in particular lady. I met Sean about 15 years ago when he was working on one of my rental homes. She got me to do a few other things, um, along with sanding the floor down and getting the house ready for it to be rented. She had mentioned, why would I start my business at the age of 35, you know, why not start now? I was very impressed with this young man. He was 22 when I first met him and just starting his business. Um, he was very excited about doing home improvement. I saw a lot of talent in him and just wanted to help out a young person. Gave me a good feeling. I went out working on properties that this lady had owned and from word of mouth and from people seeing me do work on her properties, it took off. I went from having a bicycle to a Jeep to a van. It wasn't easy, but it went from one thing to another. I was walking, looking for a job, and uh, I was trying to find something to do, so I walked past his house and he was working there and asked him for something to do. He said, and he put me on next day. That was about 12 years ago. There's been times where I want to give up, you know, and live that, what we call uh, scratch-free, uh, worry-free life, but I don't want that name. I don't want to be that type of father uh, at all. My kids are very indulged in my life. I have a good relationship with them. We have a bond that's absolutely the best. I now, I don't want to go out and hang out in the streets. I, I feel good about going home and just spending that. If it's nothing but an hour, it's nothing but saying, hey, seeing how they did in school today, if a call to my daughter or just making sure that they are secure. You know, knowing that I got a bigger plan for them, but even now it's small little things that I got to do. I have, um, the responsibility of having to help with my brother kids. Um, he's um, not here right now and you know I also have them on my mind frame so that gave me another push to I need to conquer and do more and I just want to provide a better life for them if they need that. I just want to be that clutch. The clutch that I, I didn't have. It was a group of guys, a gang of guys, that was um, at the store. And they got into a little altercation. One thing led to another, them guys um, shot my brother, multiple guys shot my brother multiple times. He, um, he later died in the hospital um, from the gunshots wound. And it all stemmed from these guys asking him what he's doing around there. And we're talking about a neighborhood where we grew up our whole life. It hurt me, it hurt me to this day because it, it happened in an area where our family house was, a place where I graduated, got my GED um, diploma, um, and a whole bunch of friends of mine. A block down from where I got my first house in 16. Um, all in the middle of these places where um, it was so much um, memories, good memories. 
And in that one little moment, they took that away. I enjoy doing home improvements because I feel that I'm helping others live a better life. A life that, you know, yes, they can live by moving somewhere else or if that's a property they have and they can't do much more with it, they can't afford to hire a high dollar licensed contractor. I want to be someone that could come in and do that same quality work for less. His main goal, he's always said from the start, was that he wanted to make Petersburg better. He's gonna bring Petersburg back, remodel all the houses, you know, help out the homeless. He has a really good heart. I feel like I'm a house doctor. I'm like, I'm not that doctor that, you know, work on your body. I'm the doctor that work on homes, but I save people's lives by doing this, by providing good protection, by removing different things that could cause harm, you know, fixing spots and floors that's about to cave in can cause and help and prevent people from falling in or worse, death, um, you know, so I take pride in what I do. I love what I do. Um, and it's never about the money. I know I need money to survive and eat, of course, but I tend to do a lot of jobs and sometimes I ask people, what do you have? I feel like this is what I'm meant for. I'm meant to help these folks that can't, that don't know how, you know, don't have the resources. And I started, I mean, I found out that, I mean, everyone, some, you know, you have young to old, different, that need help with these homes out here, different situations, and I love it. She was the best mom and boy could ever, or a girl could ever have. Kate Kinzel's mother was special to many people. An entire crowd gathered at the Virginia Beach Kellum High School field where Janine Kinzel taught physical education for 14 years. But last week, she died unexpectedly. She always pushed on as a brave example for her three children that meant the world to her. Everyone had to let go, but 11-year-old Kate says he'll keep his mother's spirit in his heart. I just wanted to do a follow in her footsteps. Hi everyone, I'm Kay Jamison and I'm doing my documentary called Half the Battle. That's my life story based on my trauma that I experienced as a child up until now. So I have a lot of happy memories about my mom. One of my most favorites is just over a period of time, I try to get her to allow me to do her makeup for her. Probably the 10th time I finally got to do it. And it was the most amazing thing. Cause I wrote, I got lipstick and I you know, drew lipstick on her mouth and then on her cheeks, I drew a heart and I said, you know, I love mom. And I think she got the camera and then we took a picture together. I was holding up the peace sign and I saw, I have that picture somewhere, um, either in person or on my phone. And it's probably the, the best thing that I've you know, ever had. It's amazing. Got one of the biggest hearts uh, of a lady that uh, I've ever worked with had. She loved the kids. They liked her a lot. She was able, she was really easy to talk to. 
you know, and sometimes kids don't want to talk to their teachers because they feel like they're unapproachable. And Janine was just totally opposite. You could always talk to her. She even would talk to me all the time. <laughs> a lot of my childhood was spent, you know, in the hospital visiting her. And so I think this is where a lot of the confusion takes place because a lot of this was normal for me, and I didn't ever think to dive deeper into it because it was just normal to me. There's one time where my mom shaved her head the day of, and we were having one of our many awesome hangouts that we have, uh, just watching a movie or something, and I think she turns down the volume and she stops what she's doing, and she looks over at me, and she was like, do you still think that I'm pretty, even though that I don't have hair. And, and I looked over at her and I said like, of course, of course I think you're beautiful, mom. That's when I felt like I couldn't do anything. Chemo, no good, you know, the, the treatment that you had to go through and so forth, it was taking a toll on her body, you know? She got her new hair one time. And I said, oh, look at this, man, we got a new one. And I was just trying to make it, and she says, only you can make me laugh, you know. But she looked great, you know, and that's what I was trying to tell her. I said, you look great. I said, you want me to shave my head? She goes, oh, God, no. <laughs> that's just how she is. At the service, it was a real awakening moment. The person grabbed my hand and slowly like, took me up to see her one last time. When, when I looked at her, I thought that it would be one of those moments where she was just joking. I thought she was gonna pop up and say, you know, gotcha. And, and when, when it didn't happen, I knew that something was wrong. Having all this, all this just hurt stuck inside and you don't know what to do with it and it just sits there and sits there and gets worse and no one to talk to. And the only person I felt like talking to or I knew that really cared is now gone. that Janine helped me more than I ever helped her. And um, what I mean by that is, when she was going through cancer, um, I called to tell her that my dad had cancer. And she was like, oh, Christy, I'm so sorry. And my dad happened to be going to the same doctor group that she was going to. And Janine kind of led me through um, the path of what was going to happen and how things would proceed and she was always really really positive positive. and when I would talk to my dad about Janine he would be oh he would always say she is so strong god she's so strong why does something like that have to happen to her and um, I think she helped me because I would call her all the time because I was worried about my father um, but now there's there's nobody who I can talk to like that because she was my always my go-to person. That's probably the best gift that I've ever been given is her friendship and I truly miss her so much. So my Christian faith has definitely been a huge, huge part of my life. And I owe that much to my best friend, Aaron Runzo. He's always looking for the best in people. And I think another quality that I really love about Cade is um, he's like a sponge and he soaks up um, anything and everything that would benefit his character or his, 
personal or spiritual growth, so that's one thing that I really admire about him. There's always a deeper and more intentional reason for him seeking out relationships with others rather than just to love them because it's the right thing to do. I believe that he loves others because he truly longs to love them. Up until when I was introduced to you know Aaron, my whole faith took a took a huge leap because I never have had a person in my life that would invite me to go to church with him and his family, would invite me to to even meet his family at his house and come hang out at his house with you know when they're doing family game nights when you know, I needed someone at Longwood when I needed someone during high school with whatever it was, whether, whether it was faith, whether it was girls, whether it was friends, family, uh, depression, anxiety. He would always be there for me. We would always have like two, three hour conversations. Two of the biggest things are his relationship with his mother combined with the unfortunate passing of his mother and then to the relationship with his father. And so I'd say that those are two things that definitely have taken a toll on him and been challenges that he has uh, been working through and coping with over the years. But I've definitely seen how that has motivated him and strengthened him because he knows what false peace and false relationship looks like. Aaron has has been there for me throughout everything. Like if I didn't have Aaron and his family, I don't know what I would have done. And that's just, you know, God knowing what you need and providing for you. Through the Lord, he has allowed Cade to use his challenges and his and the trials in his life to build him up and strengthen him. This being just the very beginning of what all of this is being used for in Kate's life. So if I could have my mom sitting here in front of me today, I would just, I would honestly tell her that I'm so working to make her proud and make her happy and make a difference in people's lives for the better, no matter how hard it may be. I've been having dreams of my mom ever since you know it happened when i was 11 years old and there's a commonality within every dream and that is that whenever i see her i just always run up to her and just give her a huge hug and just say you know mom where were you i needed you and then the dream always ends so I, I think that this is a, a symbolization of just her being present in my life and just her coming back to visit, but also her saying that I'm okay. I'm okay, and she's always with me no matter what, and it's okay to let go. No matter what bad thing I had to experience even after my mom had passed away with, you know, depression, anxiety, isolation, that it, it's all leading to something. You know, if I didn't have those tragic experiences, I wouldn't know how to empathize with others. I wouldn't know how to, the value of listening to someone and what they're going through, no matter how silly or no matter how small it may be. And without this experience, I wouldn't have that and be who I am.
My name's Victoria, and this is my family. It started when my parents came together. They blended and created a family. The birth of my brother and I symbolizes a collaboration of differences. And down the line, those differences have led to some difficult situations. We anger people who reject change. And we are burdened by a bigoted society. But through it all, we have persisted. And this is our story. My name is Victoria Coleman. My name is Hazel Coleman. Caleb Coleman. Uh, my name is Colin Coleman. I think when discussing our life and just our family and his existence, you really have to start with the beginning and when my parents first started dating. Obviously, uh, my mom's a white woman, my dad's a black man, and they became a couple in a state where Interracial relationships were literally illegal less than a lifetime ago. My dad had some concerns about like interracial relationships and um, the problems that he foresaw us having with um, his background being from an area without a lot of minorities and noticing how people were treated there. Some of my parents' friends had made comments um, that I could do better in their minds that I was settling. One of my best friend's grandfathers growing up, we were pretty close and he would say that white people should be with white people and black people should be with black people. But you know, it was different situations. Mom and dad, as you know, mm -hmm. were 19 when they had us. Um, very few people plan to have kids at 19 and nobody plans to have twins at 19. <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> for lack of better words, we probably should have been aborted. I know that if I was in that position, I would be uh, very worried and uh, very concerned about what in the world I was going to do. Go get the camera. Oh, so cute. Yay, what a big boy. Hi, Carly. As we grew up and our family moved from a very mixed area in Virginia Beach to a very um, white, like predominantly white area, I think that's when I really first realized that a lot of people had problems with our family. I mean, one of our first neighbors, I think I was working on something, cutting the grass. And he came up to me and said, oh, oh, do you live here? I said, yeah, I live here. He said, um, well, are your parents home? I'm thinking, what do you mean are my parents home? I was 24. And I mean, the neighborhood was a little bit under 300,000, right? But then he was like, well, are your parents home or whoever owns the house, they're here? I said, no, this is my house. And then ever since that conversation, he was just always funny and always bringing up little things and always trying to have like this, this competition that I was never trying to have with him. Like, of course, one time, I mean, even our, in our last neighborhood, I mean, it was a very nice community. And we got pulled over looking at Christmas lights, driving through our own neighborhood. And weren't speeding, weren't doing anything illegal, weren't. Then, I, I mean, I told a cop specifically, I said, you, you pulled me over because I was driving while black. And he really didn't have anything to say. I said, well, why did you pull me over? Oh, we had some calls of people driving slow. I'm like, well, people are driving slow looking at Christmas lights. My neighbors typically keep their distance. <laughs> and some of that's due to age because we started young. But some of it, I believe, is due to us being, you know, too, um, too much of a motley crew for them, so to speak. We had first moved to Chesapeake uh, in Great Bridge when um, we were playing outside. And then, like, that dude in the truck drove by. And like, you know, we were used to waving to people whenever we were outside and then the dude like yelled the N-word at us. And I was just like, wow, I, at 10, I didn't really know what it meant. 
but that was like the first time I ever realized that there was an, like a problem, not with us, but just with society. And then a couple of years later is when I finally realized, oh, that was not okay. Like I was a 10 year old. That was a grown, like old man. <laughs> I feel like I was aware of race and our differences from a young age. I remember one time when I was like three or four, my mother had a friend over who was a Asian lady. I'm pretty sure she was Filipino. And I straight up told my mom that this lady was my mother because she had tan skin like I did. And I don't really remember how my mom reacted to that, but I can only imagine it was a little bit of sadness because she realized I knew that me and her were not the same when um our teacher was reading us some story and she was talking about um just an african-american child and then my friend mark next to me goes african-american just like caleb and points at me and i was like stared at him and i was like what is he talking about and um you know i guess that's when i first noticed that there's even differences between people that you aren't all just people I think that when my brother and I started, like, maybe middle school, high school, we started encountering a lot of problems, mainly directed from our peers um, with our skin color. You sound too white for us, or like, why do you insist on sounding that way? And why do you insist on using, like, large words in your vocabulary? And I'm just like, I'm not, and I'm not like, consciously doing this for a while like whenever I did try and make friends or like try and do things with kids they would I would often either get you can't do this because you're white or like I would get that from black kids or I would get uh, you can't do that because you're black from like the white kids like if I ever wanted to skateboard with people they'd be like no that's like a white thing you can't do that and I'm like what are you talking about like what do you mean that's a white thing I wouldn't say it was necessarily a conscientious decision I just noticed that more often than not um, like black kids would kind of ostracize me sometimes more so than white kids at least to my face and then that I found that more often than not like white people and white kids at my schools and stuff accepted more so that I was mixed rather than making fun of it or like using that as like the brunch of or using it as like the basis for their jokes and stuff. I definitely know like the way that teachers treated you guys like in some ways, I felt like they had lower expectations. And so when you did as well as you did, it sort of caused them to like praise you maybe more than the average student in that regard. But, and then in some ways I felt like they sort of had such low expectations from the get go, which bothered me. I remember one time in particular, I was set to visit Columbia University um, because I was getting recruited by their basketball team and obviously Columbia is an Ivy League program. I just remember I was telling my friends about it because I was obviously looking forward to going to Manhattan, being a lover of New York. And one of my teachers, she overheard me telling my friends about our upcoming trip and uh, she was just like, how did you make that work? And I'm like, what do you mean? How did I make that work? Like, um, are my straight A's like not enough. The fact that I broke state records in basketball my freshman year and continued to excel and I'm literally in like the top 10 players in Hampton Roads right now. I was like, is that not enough to prove myself? Like how much more do I have to do to prove myself? And why do you just assume that I am not a go-getter because of my race? I have seen and heard comments over the years that have just like really boggled my mind um, by people who I was showing properties to that didn't know I was in a mixed relationship. Um, when people find out that I'm in a mixed relationship, I've heard comments about that, like a lot of um, snide comments or just, you know, like off-putting jokes that sort of make me feel very uncomfortable. Um, I think they treated, they treated your mother a certain way or treated me a certain way. And then they would find out, oh, where we live, and, and or uh, maybe find out a little bit of something about what I did or what my job was. And then they, some people like completely ro role reversed. 
there were some things that have happened along the way that would make me feel like I was being judged um, unfairly. Like, for instance, with maintaining your hair when you were younger and your hair was sort of an in-between, you know, I think the texture and the um, curl and the product that it needed wasn't exactly like what, you know, my mother-in-law would need and it wasn't exactly what I would need. So it was sort of finding the products that straddled the line. Obviously, mothers maintain their daughter's hair usually and with her, she had no idea how to take care of it, at least at the start. And she definitely did a great job on educating herself and doing the research. Um, but of course, uh, there were times when certain things we tried didn't work. And that left me feeling very sad about my hair. And then I would go to school and people would say, hey, Victoria, you would look so pretty if you straightened it. And I'm just like, well, I mean, am I not pretty now? So... I think the whole hair situation, even to this day, has very much affected my confidence. I can't breathe. Please, the knee my dick. I can't breathe shit. Uh -huh. Bro, get up, get in the car, man. I will. Get, get up, get in the car. I can't move. I've been waiting the whole time, ah. man. I think when viewing the events that happened last summer, such as the Black Lives Matter protests in response to multiple unjustified killings by the police of black Americans, such as Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, um, George Floyd, it's really hard to witness that. And obviously there's something in the black community called the talk, or that's what it's been branded as. And it's basically like an official discussion that you have with your coming of age black child, basically warning them that, hey, the world is not always going to be kind to you and you could be doing everything right. And still one, one thing could go wrong and you could end up, well, in this case, dead. I think it's very important to have that talk. Society sees us as black. They don't see us as mixed. You know, it's one of those things where they have a position of power over you. And historically we've seen that get abused you know it may not be that yeah not every cop is dirty not every cop's going to like you know just shoot an unarmed minority for no reason but there's enough of a precedent for it to where we genuinely do need to look out for it and it is enough of an issue to where you know we need to have conversations about it so me growing up in chesapeake i would get pulled over and i had a moderately decent car but i had a nice sound system and a jeep cherokee with a had rims on it, and it was decent looking, but it wasn't anything to write home about. And I would get pulled over a lot, and I got guns put on me multiple times, been pulled over by five and six police cars. So in my mind, I definitely had it, and I've always told you, hey, you know what? You guys, even though you're biracial, you know, they're, they're, in a lot of places in society, you won't get one chance. But then some people will give you one chance, but I always wanted to set you up for worst case scenario, but, but hope for the best case. Like obviously I was cognizant of safety for a child, like watch where you're going, don't cross the street without looking, don't talk to strangers. But I never really thought about the fact that like when they were playing jailbreak in the neighborhood, that maybe somebody could have seen, seen like a black child or a black teen playing or hiding behind their car and just automatically thought the worst, you know what I mean? Like. So I became a lot more aware and a lot more guarded and um, <clears throat> we had to have the talk at that point. So, but before that, um, I just, there was nothing in my life to draw from to understand that concept. Well, mom and dad are both, you know, pretty, uh, pretty intelligent individuals and they have a pretty good sense of what's going on uh, in our lives and like some of the things that we've dealt with, you know, they're both still you know, they're one ethnicity. And at the end of the day, they aren't connected to, they're not quite the same as us and that we have, we can't really escape either side of ourselves. 
Um, and we have to deal with issues from both ends as well as the positive sides of both ends. So, you know, as much as they care, as much as they know, they don't always know exactly how it is as much as like you or I, or like another mixed race person could know. There's certainly great parts about being a mixed child in an interracial family. Um, it's easy to kind of grab onto the negative because I think in my mind, at least the negative instances really stand out, um, which is a problem, but there's certainly great things like, um, the food, the fusion of cultures that comes. And then of course, being a melting pot of so many different types of backgrounds and such rich history. So I think at the end of the day, my experiences um, and what I hope to convey to people is that, you know, we don't sit around thinking about the fact that we're a mixed race family. We're just a family. Like, unfortunately, others and their reactions to us might cause us to reflect upon the differences. But at the end of the day, we're just people. We're no different than any other family. Um, we want to be treated as such. I mean, our relationship can be a relationship regardless of whether you're white or black or this or that. It's really more about who the different, who the person is versus what color they are. I honestly personally can't think of a single time where I genuinely wish that I was just one or the other so that I could just not deal with the things that I deal with. Um, I do genuinely appreciate the heritage that I have coming from a white and European like descended family on one side and like black and Caribbean and like Islander um, side from the other. And then I definitely appreciate the culture on both sides because it's, it's pretty rich. And, you know, I love learning more about the family on either side and, you know, meeting new people because it's just like, wow, like, you know, we're really unique and it's crazy that like all of this is basically compounded and culminated into what I am today. So I wouldn't change it for the world.
was on Sunday morning, and I don't remember the exact date, but my uh, good friend Colleen called me up and said, we gotta go protest, we gotta go protest. Let's get some signs and go downtown and protest. And so we talked about it, and I said, okay. So we decided that I would start this little private Facebook page and invite people we knew. So I started the page, I made it private, and just putting on names of people who I knew. And I said, if you know somebody who think should be on this, let me know, we'll let them in, right? So, and so Colleen and I thought, well, you know, maybe like, you know, 10 people will show up, you know, to our protest. And 75 people showed up. So who joined these protests? I would, I would like to say that it was an amazing amalgamation of citizenry in the sense that initially, I would say it was, a, it was older people and young people. And um, as it rolled out, you know, as, as the protests went on, there was young people, there were like little people with families, there were grandmas and grandpas, there was a bulk of students, non-students, just young people from the area, not from the area. And to me, um, that was the beauty of uh, the protests and who joined it, is that it was like a magnet. And like, if you have this impulse, we have the venue. Um, I think the community was nervous about it, the protests. Uh, like I said, the first, the first, very first protest, I mean, I got a call from the park ranger who was very, very helpful. You know, I had the chief of police calling me, and then almost every protest we had, we had someone contacting us. Um, and then we would contact them. We would contact the chief and say, we're planning this protest this day, because we were peaceful. There was nothing about our protests that wasn't peaceful. We were respectful, you know. Um, there were, first off, the, there were concerns by town and county leaders. Like every protest, we got phone calls from either, either um, the chief, I and mean, we tried to let the chief of police in town know, but the county administrator called both me and Megan kind of threatening, saying, if you do this, we can arrest you, sort of, um, he was threatening. Um, and there were rumors. I had a, a, a somebody, I'm not gonna say who it was, they called me and said, there's a rumor going around that they are busing in protesters to come here in the Farmville, uh, Antifa. <laughs> they're, they're gonna bring in Antifa. Which, you know, I'm like, you know, we're on the Facebook protest page, I have seen nothing like that, you know, Megan has seen nothing like that. We're not asking for outsiders to come. We don't want outside agitators to come. We have plenty of local people here who are protesting. And so they were, these were, you know, I think fear-based things that were started by the right-wing type of folks. And of course, nothing like that happened. Uh, but I think people were really afraid of some people in Book of Me about us just even protesting, which I don't understand, but they were. My involvement with the protests primarily was a participant and a supporter. There were a variety of protests out here. We, we've got to be able to differentiate. There were smaller ones that were orchestrated and organized by folks like uh, Lee um, and uh, Colleen and um, uh, Megan. And those were the smaller ones were in um, the yard of the courthouse. And um, so we went and, and we would go and participate, and I kind of missed a few of those. But then Brittany uh, Richardson um, coordinated a, um, a march. And uh, when I heard about it, when I first noticed it on the Facebook um, group, Peaceful Protest group, um, I knew immediately I wanted to help promote. So I contact uh, Brittany and um, got the details and started calling folks that I know who are influencers in the community and if they didn't already know about it, made sure they did. And um, it was about getting every group we could think of from every walk to participate. Ben, stop. Fix your ears. I got involved for just the, the lifestyle that I lead. Um, I am very connected to the black community. Um, I do have a biracial child. Um, I am in a biracial relationship. And so I saw 
through friends and loved ones what they were experiencing. Um, things that I took for granted um, with all of the unjust killings um, and the other areas in the country stepping up and doing marches and protests, I felt that it was important to make sure that the community that I am a part of was also getting involved and standing tall beside um, our brown and black brothers and sisters. We did not have a large march of thousands like we saw in other cities, but for Farmville, I felt you know proud of the amount of people that came forward. Um, in discussion, I saw, you know, there were Democrats and Republicans, you know, there were people talking about different issues, but we were talking together. We all joined together. We were all standing side by side, brothers and sisters, marching for the same purpose. What was the purpose of the protest? I know for me, we took it as an opportunity to bring out the community and put voice to issue. After uh, Brother Floyd's public execution, it was like, okay, this has got to stop. We have got to bring attention as a people. And we are in historic Farmville. And this is a place where um, a 16-year-old girl said something has to be done. A community member, I reached out, um, being a white woman, I wanted my intentions to be genuine. Um, I didn't want anybody to think that I was using this platform to right my wrongs, so to speak. I did reach out to a community member, um, Jill, and she kind of reinforced the fact that currently no one has stepped up that is brown or black. Um, and so why not? You know, if, if I'm able to present in a way that my genuine intentions can come out, then that's what's important. It's not the color of my skin. It's not anything else but the purpose of the march. Um, and in regards to maybe why no one else stepped up, I think that there was some fear. I think there is a lot of fear for people to step forward and talk about such an important topic because unfortunately it is our brown and black people who have the negative consequences when they try to step forward. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't really think it was going to go viral. Um, I had had, but I had no idea that it was going to have the, because on my page alone it was getting thousands and thousands of shares, and then I kept having friends who were tagging me in screen caps or sending me. Um, other examples of it being shared on I know it got really big on Twitter um, and I I obviously liked it so I made it but um, I really had no idea that it was going to generate that kind of reaction in so many people so the design um, was inspired by uh, a response that I have in this area and just in America in general we hear a lot of people saying I don't see race I don't see color and um, at one of my first jobs out of college I had a coworker who liked saying that a lot. And the problem with that statement is that it makes the conversation about you. And I finally told him, when you don't see colors, you don't see patterns. So it's really easy to say, well, I'm not seeing this, but I, meaning me, I am seeing this. I am seeing these people getting unfairly profiled, getting unfairly arrested, getting unfairly treated. And your choice to not notice the continuation of this issue doesn't help anyone, least of all the people being impacted by it. It's really funny when I see other people who are sharing it and, and posting it on social media, um, my race isn't really brought into question all that much. It's really funny. Like I haven't seen people who are either for it or against it um, be like, oh, it's so interesting that a white guy is saying this, and, which is fine. Like I don't, I don't want that reaction necessarily. Um, it's mostly just focusing on the message of, oh, people need to hear this. This is why when you say this isn't good. Um, but again, as a, as a white person, I can't just sit back and say, oh yeah, racism's bad, and then not do anything, not contribute to it. Um, I've heard a lot of internet posts articulating that, you know, um, in, in a society like ours, it's not just enough to not be racist, you have to be actively anti-racist. Um, so kind of in the same vein as like uh, Jane Elliott, 
Um, I want to kind of be a person who uses my whiteness as a kind of foot in the door to have conversations with people who would not have this conversation with anyone else. So as somebody who grew up here, I, I, I will be completely honest that, you know, you'll find I'm a very much a straight shooter. For the most part, like, I didn't notice the statue growing up. You know, it wasn't Lee, it wasn't Stonewall. You know, it was a generic one of a couple hundred, one of a thousand statue of the generic Confederate soldier. It didn't really bother me until I started to learn more about it all. Uh, and, and then I'm just like, yeah, why do we have this? And then you have to talk about, and then that, you know, as I meet friends from, from the North, personally, north of the Mason-Dixon line, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, y'all in the South are weird with your monuments and your street names and stuff. But like growing up here, that's not something that I thought about a lot. It's just something I was used to, like, which is so sad to say that out loud because it's like, you're just used to being, you're so used to being discriminated against that like you are desensitized to it and that you internalize it. That's kind of how I felt about the statue. It's a, it's, it's a weird part of Farmville history. Um, I just know that it needed to come down. It was part of a movement to take him down. And I have mixed feelings, partly of uh, respect and partly of regret for the way that it came down. Because it avoided bloodshed, it avoided people getting shot. I don't know if that would happen. It avoided conflict in a sense. On the other hot side, you can't avoid conflict because it's there, whether you, whether you face it now or later. They were put up to strike terror in the hearts of people. They were put up as part of a big white supremacy movement in the, the 1900s, early 1900s. And there's been a lot of folks that have been miseducated about what happened and had this romantic notion of the Civil War and this romantic notion of the Confederacy, and that's just utterly false. I'm of the mindset you learn from primary sources. You don't learn from statues, right? In my opinion, usually. I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't recall a single thing a statue has, has, has taught me in and of itself. Taking a statue down and doing that alone is a band-aid. Band-aids don't fix anything. You need to take the band-aid off to let the wound heal, at least eventually. Maybe not at first, but you know, and band-aids are important. They protect you from infection early on, but like, eventually you need to take the band-aid off to let the wound heal. What should people know about the protests in Farmville? They should know that the community came together against some very common ills in society. To see so many locals, so many people from here, from different groups, showing their power and their light, I'll never forget it. Yeah, I have, I, the, the bar went up, I have high expectations, you know? And, you, and I'm going to put some emphasis here. These individuals I'm referring to have always been active groups in the community, but have they ever joined forces? Not everybody. That day, almost everybody was together. Almost everybody was represented on some level. I think that's awesome. My dream for Farmville, my dream for Prince Edward County, is when people come here, I want people to be able to go to whatever school they want without people judging them. I want them to look at this community and then look at the history and be like, wait, 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 this is the same community? I want them to be genuinely shocked when they find out the history that happened here. The current state of Farmville um, in the past 70 years, as we um, mark the seventh an 70th anniversary, right, of um, the school protest, I see healing. Um, I think there's still healing. I see progress on many levels. I see progress, so yeah. Anybody can be the change. Um, I don't think that it has to be one person. I don't think that it has to be a large group of people. It has to be somewhere, someone somewhere willing to make that happen. I don't care if you are small town Virginia or Farmville. I don't care if you're large city California. Change can happen anywhere. It's just going to take someone willing to put in the work to make it happen.
All righty, thanks for sticking with us here. Woo! So, in order, the documentaries you watched, so the first one was From the Streets to Success, the story of Sean White, produced by Megan Strudel. Half the Battle, produced by Cade Jameson. The Interracial Experience, a Coleman family perspective, produced by Victoria Coleman. And finally, Civil Circuit, produced by Sam Chase. So, let's go to the winners. My official envelope. We have a tie for third place. So tied for third place are Megan Strodel. Let's give Megan a round of applause. And Kate Jamison tied for third place. Let's give him a round of applause. That means our second place documentary winner go to Victoria Coleman. Let's give Victoria a round of applause. And come on up, Sam Chase. Congratulations, you are our first place documentary winner. <laughs> They're ignoring you, Sam. You've already made the documentary, so they don't have to listen to you anymore. <laughs> well done, Sam. Thank you. So tell us a little bit how you got involved in this last summer and your piece. So uh, I've been working on this piece for, I guess, over a year now. Um, I started out as a photographer for the uh, Cecil Farmville Project for Justice, if I got that correctly. Um, and um, I was working with Ashley Johnson and Alex Hosterman being their photographers. And it was, it was a, you know, a lot of struggles. I mean, there was a, a let's just say, a very proud confederate who was uh, trying to even sue me at the time, uh, you know, for these photographs. And so when uh, the time came where I took uh, Dr. Grover's class, you know, I had to decide, well, what do I want to do? And I'm like, oh, it makes sense to work with who I know. So um, I got Lee and Colleen and Jill and James and Kanan and Brittany together. And, um, you know, I really could not have done it without them. I really want to say a big thank you to them. You know, they're, they don't want to come with me on stage, you know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's really thanks to them that, you know, these protests even started. And I think they're um, definitely some of the notable heroes in this town who, um, kind of continued this history that we have, and of course, um, this always, you know, it's we still want to get these Confederate statues down. And I know um, some people want to use this documentary to help help do that, um, you know. And and like Kanan said in the documentary, it is just a band aid. And I saw uh, Victoria nodding her head when he said that, you know, it is just a band aid. So I'm just happy to be part of something. Um, that's notable in this town's history because you know our town does have big stuff that has gone unnoticed. So yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Sam. Well done. <laughs> stay up here. You get stay up there. <laughs> all right. So that does wrap up the fifth annual Longwood Media Showcase. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank you all in YouTube land for sticking through us. Uh, will we have all the winners? I will mention to everyone. Please come to the stage. Who's won tonight? Everybody else again. Thank you for the evening. Good night, and we will see you next year for the 6th Annual Longwood Media Showcase. Thank you very much. Kate, Kate Gray, Kate, Megan, yeah, Tyler, oh, uh, Anthony, Corey, come on up here, please. Monet, all the winners, please do come up to the stage. We can end the YouTube whenever you would like. <laughs> Yeah, you did. Get up here. You want honorable mention. <laughs>